Good evening, everybody. Let's try that again. Good evening, everybody. You, you're here as diehards because you're here for the final session of AIDS 2019. On behalf of the IAS, I'd really like to welcome you. And I think this session is important for a number of reasons. Because there was so much choice here. I know for me, I couldn't go to all the sessions that I wanted to go to. I couldn't experience everything. So we hope that in the next hour, we are going to take you on a, on a railroad ride of some highlights, of, of some of the sessions you may have missed. So if there's any questions you have, this is the time to look at it. And I really hope that as you experience the different tracks, you'll be able to go, aha, even though I wasn't at that session, I'll get a flavor of that. So without further ado, we've got four really great leads who are gonna, who've done a great job of summing up all the great science, all the great experience that over the last three days. And so I'm gonna start immediately with track A. I'd really like to welcome Fabio Romerio, who is an assistant professor at the Institute of Human Virology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. So Fabio, welcome. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, it is my pleasure tonight to give the closing report for the Track A Basic Science. Uh, this is not my presentation. Um, it's not my presentation. Okay. So, uh, first of all, I would like to say that that's not me. That's me. There you go. Thank you. Okay, it will be my pleasure to give the uh, closing report for Track A Basic Science and this presentation, as well as all the, re, uh, the uh, session and daily reports that were published online throughout the week are uh, team effort. And so I definitely want to acknowledge my colleagues, uh, Elizabeth Wanderlich, Angela Wall, and Aurelio orta uh, for their work and effort throughout the week. Uh, so what I'm gonna do uh, in the next uh, 12, 13, 14 minutes is to give uh, a few highlights about uh, the entire conference and uh, some of the most, uh, what we thought were the most, most interesting talks. And I tried, we tried to organize them uh, in, in themes. And the first theme that I would like to uh, introduce is that of uh, new cellular and anatomical reservoirs of HIV. And the first uh, talk I would like to touch upon was given yesterday by Jonathan Ganner, who uh, gave a very compelling uh, presentation about the role of macrophages as a reservoir for replication competent HIV. Uh, in this study, uh, Jonathan looked at uh, urethral uh, macrophages uh, in HIV infected individuals, and he found that these cells contained integrated HIV DNA that can be reactivated after uh, uh, LPS stimulation, giving rise to uh, uh, allowing detection of in situ of HIV RNA and HIV proteins. Uh, and so certainly this is a clear demonstration that macrophages are indeed a long-term reservoir for HIV. Uh, next, I would like to go again uh, over the role of naive T cells as a reservoir for HIV. And we heard two talks that point clearly in that direction. The first one, uh, and they were back-to-back -back talks yesterday afternoon. The first one was given by Emanuele Venanzi. Uh, who show that although naive CD4 T cells contain a low frequency of integrated HIV, a very high percentage of these integrated providers uh, are intact. Uh, and right after him, uh, Jory Simons showed that uh, clonal expansion of HIV is more frequent in uh, more uh, differentiated uh, CD4 T cell subsets. And so if you put these two presentations together, it is quite clear that naive T cells are important reservoir for HIV because they are long lived, they are transcriptionally silent, and so they are more uh, hidden to the immune system, and also because they can replenish uh, the memory uh, reservoir through differentiation. And the third uh, presentation I would like to touch upon about um, uh, new reservoirs uh, is uh, also a presentation from a fellow Italian, Paola Sette, uh, who looked at uh, SIV-infected and uh, ART-suppressed 
uh, pigtail macaques, and, uh, and she clearly showed that um, uh, there is an infiltration of um, SIV-infected CD4 T cells in uh, both pericardial and peritoneal um, uh, ad adipose tissue in these animals. And so uh, these three talks show that the concept that CD4, memory CD4 T cells and lymphoid tissues are the uh, are unique uh, reservoirs for HIV is, is incorrect. There are additional cell types, there are additional tissues and organs, and so this information has to inform uh, how we design cure strategies moving forward. Uh, speaking about cure strategy, I would like to discuss uh, two uh, talks uh, that highlight uh, potentially two new uh, latency reversing agents. The first one uh, is, is AZD55A2, which is a SMAC mimetic. So this is a uh, molecule that is able to activate NF-kappa-B through the non-canonical pathway, uh, um, and uh, leading to a, long, uh, a slower but long la longer lasting effect. And uh, we heard talks from uh, two uh, established uh, scientists at UNC. One of them is my former uh, mentor, David Margolis, uh, who showed that uh, AZD55A2 uh, induces uh, a much smaller set of host genes uh, than in ingenol in uh, CD4 T cells, and therefore is potentially uh, less toxic. And also, uh, this compound is able to uh, reactivate HIV latency, uh, both in um, uh, cell line models as well as in uh, CD4 T cells from HIV patients ex vivo. And then we heard a talk from Victor Garcia, uh, also at UNC, as I mentioned. And Victor looked at uh, two different preclinical models of HIV infection. He studied uh, um, HIV-infected humanized mice, uh, uh, ART-suppressed uh, HIV-infected humanized mice, as well as HIV-infected ART-suppressed uh, monkeys. And he, he was able to show that uh, AZD55A2 is able to reactivate HIV and HIV in these two models. Uh, the next um, um, novel latency reversing agent is a uh, uh, sting, uh, sting agonist. And we heard about it just a few minutes ago uh, in a talk by Maud Mavenier. Um, so sting is a um, uh, ER-associated factor that senses nucleic acids, and when you trigger the sting pathway, uh, it, you lead at activation of transcription factors that are involved in HIV expression, and also uh, T-cell-specific immune responses. And so uh, she looked at the effect of a sting agonist in SIV-infected ART-suppressed monkeys, and two of six of these monkeys showed a robust SIV reactivation after multiple stimulation with the sting agonist, and also uh, activation of um, uh, SIV-specific uh, CD4 T cell responses. And so uh, these two talks, uh, these two um, uh, slides summarize efforts toward development of new latency reversing agents that go beyond the classical uh, HDAC inhibitors and others that we have heard about over the last few years. Um, <clears throat> yesterday, there was an, uh, a very beautiful presentation uh, plenary s in the plenary session by Adam, um, uh, I forget the last name, I apologize. Um, uh, yes, uh, I, I apologize, I forget the last name, but uh, a beautiful presentation uh, uh, about the role of the microbiome uh, plays in uh, the uh, immune activation. And uh, there was also an entire session about the microbiome. And one of the presentations uh, was given by Laura Noel Romas. And uh, in her study, Laura looked at uh, women who uh, take MPA or Depo-Provera contracept as a contraceptive. Uh, and she found that women who have high levels of MPA uh, display high level, also high levels of infection, but only in situations where uh, their vaginal microbiome is um, uh, lactobacillus dominant. Uh, so this doesn't happen when uh, there are high levels of MPA 
but uh, the vaginal microbiome is not lactobacillus dominant. So what this means is that the microbiome uh, can uh, uh, alter and can affect the way uh, the organism responds to uh, uh, MPA uh, um, uh, treatment or MPA assumption um, and increasing uh, or not the risk of acquiring um, SIV. And remaining in terms of remaining in terms of uh, HIV infection in women. Uh, we've also heard a beautiful talk from uh, John Karn, who looked at the role of estrogen in regulating uh, HIV transcription. And in this study, in this study John showed that uh, uh, estrogen can suppress HIV transcription and HIV reactivation from latency, as well as viral uh, spreading. Uh, and, and this evidence was confirmed by, uh, and this, uh, this information was confirmed by evidence that, um, uh, surprisingly, the viral reservoir expands with age in women uh, as they go through reproductive aging. So normally, the viral reservoir either stays stable or slightly declines, but in women who, under, who, goes through, uh, who go through uh, reproductive aging and so lose expression of estrogen, the uh, reservoir appears to expand. Um, moving on to uh, another theme, uh, the role of uh, the relationship between integration sites and providal sequences, we've heard uh, two very interesting talks. One uh, was from, um, by Matthias Lichterfeld, uh, who looked at three HIV-infected patients on long-term antiretroviral therapy. And uh, Matthias demonstrated that in these three individuals, uh, intact providers are found more frequently in uh, non-genic uh, chromosomal regions and also in regions that are less accessible uh, to transcription factors. And so this points to the fact that uh, intact providers uh, may have a feature of uh, a deeper latency. And, um, uh, after that, we also heard a, a very interesting talk, as always, from Yashi Ho, who showed that uh, um, uh, in some cases, HIV integration is able to drive uh, transcription and also protein expression of host genes downstream of the providers. And in the case of cancer genes, uh, this may lead to cell proliferation and clonal expansion. Um, and so, uh, clearly these two talks together uh, underscore how HIV integration I is not uh, uh, an event that has no consequences, but certainly there is an interplay between the host chromosome, the host genes, and uh, the providal uh, uh, genome. Um, in my opinion, one of the highlights of this uh, uh, entire meeting was this report by Xu Yu, who talked about the San Francisco patient. So this is an individual who was diagnosed back in 1992 and uh, was never under, an, under antiretroviral therapy. <clears throat> and um, there are tw about 24 years of recorded undetectable viremia for this individual. And over uh, 30 viral tests, there are below the limit of detection. And um, despite extensive um, testing and sampling uh, of this uh, patient um, by IPDA that detects intact in providal DNA, and also by QVOA, it was, uh, it, so far it's been impossible to recover, in, uh, to identify intact uh, DNA sequences and to rescue uh, HIV from uh, the latent reservoir from this patient. And this may be the first example of natural sterilizing cure uh, that we've heard about, or at least that I've heard about. So um, I have only uh, two more slides left, so I think I'm on time. Um, and uh, the first one um, is a presentation uh, today from Lydie Tournois, who uh, showed how um, uh, HIV-infected individuals who are treated earlier uh, in, uh, during the acute infection with antiretroviral therapy maintain CD4 T cells that are more functional and then have a higher uh, killing ability 
However, these patients at the same time have a much lower frequency of uh, uh, HIV-specific CD8 T cells. And so this underscores how, <clears throat> on one hand, antiretro early antiretroviral therapy, uh, uh, again, on one hand, uh, reduces uh, the seeding of the latent reservoir, leading to a smaller reservoir, uh, but on the other hand, doesn't allow full development of proper and, and uh, immune responses. And so it would be interesting to see whether uh, it's possible to treat early so that we can reduce the establishment of the latent reservoir, uh, but then expand these functional CD80 cells possibly through uh, therapeutic vaccination. And the last slide, um, uh, I'm showing it, it's a very interesting new technology that was presented by Francois Vinigier and uh, it's called Im uh, Immunopet CT. So this is a technology that combines uh, Immunopet, so it's uh, the use of, uh, through the use of antibodies against SAV that are conjugated to um, uh, radionuclides and in combination with CT. Um, and uh, so what we're seeing here are six images of the same SIV-infected uh, monkey. And on the left, we see two images taken during antiretroviral therapy. And so if you, if you look at the intestinal area, you don't see any green, which shows that there is no viral replication as expected, considering that the animal is under antiretroviral therapy. <clears throat> but following interruption, uh, three weeks after interruption, then in the, f in the four images on the right, you see quite a bit of green in the intestinal area, showing that HIV, uh, SAV replication has uh, reemerged. And th so this is a beautiful technology because you can see very rapidly and without the need to sample the, uh, the, the, the animal, <coughs> um, you can uh, monitor uh, the dynamics of SAV replication. And importantly, this technology is able to detect viral reactivation to one or two weeks prior to uh, viremia rebound. And uh, with that, I will stop. I will thank you all for your attention, and I also would like to take this opportunity to thank on, also on behalf of my colleagues, um, um, Nicola Chamon and Nancy Archen for the opportunity to act as uh, rapporteurs uh, and to serve the HIV community. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Fabio. I'm sure you'll agree that in 15 minutes, he's made, made, taken you on a magical journey of what happened in track A. So as we move now to track B, I'd, I'd really like to introduce Laura Waters, who is an HIV and hepatitis lead at the Central and Northwest London NHS Foundation Trust, Mortimer, Mortimer Market Street in London. Welcome, Laura, and we look forward to track B. So good evening, everybody. It's my honor to present the Track B Rapporteur highlights, although we should have probably been Track D for Dolutegravir, as you will see. These are my disclosures. My main disclosure is thanks to being in Mexico City's noisiest hotel. I had two hours sleep last night, so if I trip over my words, it's not tequila. I'm exhausted. Firstly, I must thank the Team B Track Rapporteurs. They've been absolutely amazing. James McMahon from Australia, Colleen Kelly from the US, and Luis Mosqueda from here in Mexico has also been translating the daily summaries into Spanish. They've all been wonderful, particularly today when I've not done much reporting at all. So although this topic of PrEP overlaps with Track C as a sexual health position, I wanted to touch on it a little. The rise of STIs preceded the advent of PrEP and the rise of STIs is not a reason to withhold PrEP. Much of the rise also is due to settings where STI screening was not performed as frequently as it has since PrEP has been available. Now, there was some discussion in one of the sessions about antibiotic prophylaxis, just a word of caution, please don't treat any STIs with single dose azithromycin, and certainly not for prevention either. And of note, there was an oral poster from a cohort in German MSM, which showed that mycoplasma genitalium was the most frequent STI, more common than chlamydia or gonorrhea, and that may have implications for prevention strategies. Discover, I won't dwell on much, that's a track C topic, but this is the trial that showed TAF-FTC was non-inferior to TDF-FTC for PrEP at Croy earlier this year. 
We saw an analysis at this meeting which showed expected PK, but my team felt that the efficacy and adverse event assertions were perhaps premature, and really our focus should be on expanding access to affordable PrEP globally. Moving on to cascades of care, this was a huge topic, I'm putting it into a very small slide. A couple of points to make are that differences in definitions can make it very challenging to compare cascades. So for example, choice of denominators. I think we all recognize that broad cascades may mask inequities in different populations and focused subpopulation cascades are essential to identify barriers for underserved populations, including trans people and indigenous people. I think a great quote on Monday was, why are we asking relatively well people to attend clinics? Only clinicians think that's fun. And when we think about engagement and retention, we must be delivering care in a way that our patients would choose. Preconception, dolutegravir exposure, and neural tube defects has been a huge focus over the last 15 months or so, and the very eagerly anticipated and now published updated results of the Botswana cohort with more than 1,200 additional dolutegravir exposures since the initial analysis have shown an attenuation of the impact from 0.94 to 0.3 prevalence of NTDs. If we look at the prevalence difference on the bottom line of the table, we see that there is a statistically significant, though very small, prevalence difference compared to the other groups, including women on ephedrines at conception and HIV-negative women. Oh, sorry. The key thing is this cohort will probably never truly refute the association if it's not real. We also saw data from a Brazil cohort with no NTDs in almost 400 pregnancies and an update from the antiretroviral pregnancy registry. Really the number of integrase exposures, particularly dolutegravir, are too small to draw meaningful conclusions. The 0.4% dolutegravir signal is driven by one single event, so please do upload your exposure cases to the website. What really wasn't discussed early enough in the reaction to the initial signal were the disadvantages of alternatives to dolutegravir, the association between protease inhibitors and preterm delivery, and models showing that there will be more virologic failure and more transmission to sexual partners and to infants if women were on ephedrines as compared to dolutegravir. There was lots of work trying to find a mechanism, some folate receptor antagonism studies, which really showed no consistent effect and any findings were associated with very high dolutegravir concentrations. Animal studies also inconclusive. There was one zebrafish study, I've put it in more because I like zebrafish than anything else, but what it did show is that dolutegravir toxicity could be reversed by folate. Community engagement, of course, is absolutely crucial, and the fact there was little or no community engagement at the very start was something we must learn important lessons from, and informed choice must remain at the center of everything we do. Of course, the WHO have updated their guidelines, and we heard, as we heard, and dolutegravir is now the preferred option for all adolescents and adults first line, including women of childbearing age. One other issue that emerged in the early response was some countries wanted to limit access to dolutegravir to women with effective contraception. Of course, that requires access to effective contraception. Contraception leads me on to ECHO. ECHO also has been published. This was a large randomized controlled trial looking at two different long-acting hormonal methods of contraception and comparing them to a non-hormonal intrauterine device. It was undertaking, undertaken due to a cohort signal suggesting that the long-acting hormonal methods may be associated with a higher risk of HIV acquisition in HIV-negative women, but this RCT did not show a difference in HIV risk. What we saw at this conference was pregnancy incidence. This is looking at typical rather than perfect use, and what you see is all three methods are highly effective. However, in the adjusted hazard ratio analysis, there was a trend to the injectable being better than the IUD, a trend for the implant being better than the ejectable, but significantly the implant was better than the IUD. So if the implant is the most effective method, we must remember this cannot be given if women are on ephedrines. You see significant reductions in progesterone exposure that aren't addressed by a, in, in, uh, inserting two implants as we saw at Croy. Keeping on the topic of ephedrines, this is Reflate TB2. This was a trial undertaken based on promising phase two and PK data, looking at TDF3TC backbone with either raltegravir 400 twice daily or ephedrine 600 once daily in people on standard TB treatment. 
What it showed was that week 48, 66% of people on efavirenz compared to 61% on raltegravir had an undetectable viral load, and you can see from the middle bars that was driven by virologic non-response. Of note, one in three people had a CD4 below 40, and three quarters had a viral load above 100,000. If we look at the forest plot, raltegravir failed to show non-inferiority, so efavirenz 600 clearly remains the preferred option in this setting. Lessons are, I think we've learned many times before, that phase two results may not translate into phase three, but importantly here, highlighting that differences may emerge after week 24, because at the week 24 time point, both arms performed similarly. Now moving on to dolutegravir, I'm gonna focus on efficacy and weight, but I want to highlight a PK sub-analysis of the Odyssey study, uh, looking at dolutegravir PK in children between six and 20 kilograms in weight, and that's gonna inform imminent submissions to the FDA and EMA. Now, Gemini showed us last year that at week 48, dolutegravir in the Mididine dual therapy first line was non-inferior to triple therapy with TDF-FTC dolutegravir, and reassuringly, that's been maintained out to week 96 with the dual regimen remaining non-inferior. Importantly, there was no emergent resistance. What Gemini doesn't tell us is about the efficacy of this option in switch, but thankfully Tango also presented today did, and in Tango, people suppressed on a regimen of TAF, FTC, and a third agent, mainly l covisistat in two-thirds of participants. They were randomized to stay on their TAF-based regimen or switch to dolutegravir and imididine dual therapy. What we see here is almost identical and very low rates of viral failure, almost identical and very high rates of viral suppression. And again, the forest plots show no significant difference. Dolutegravir and imididine is non-inferior in this setting. Again, no emergent resistance. However, these studies were justifiably criticized uh, for, for the predominantly male participant inclusion. That certainly wasn't true of advance. This, again, is a study that was published today in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this first-line trial in South Africa randomized more, more than 1,000 people to TAF-FTC dolutegravir, TDF-FTC dolutegravir, or TDF-FTC efavirenz. As I mentioned, 60% were female. Almost all participants were black. And the author stated that the participants were drawn from a group that re is representative of almost a quarter of the global epidemic. Here are the results in terms of viral suppression at week 48. There is little difference between the arms. It's not statistically significant and is high in all groups. It was actually age and employment that were more predictive of response than the antiretroviral regimen selected, and young unemployed people experiencing much lower rates of viral suppression than their older employed counterparts. The OT analysis showed 95 to 96% suppression in all arms, which is astonishing considering there was no baseline resistance testing and pre-art NNRCI resistance approach is 15% in this region. Moving on to weight gain, this is a slide from Michelle Morehouse's presentation, looking at some of the factors that have been associated with weight gain on art over the last year or so. Dolutegravir and Victegravir, a lesser degree protease inhibitors, most at risk appear to be women and black individuals, and there may be a protective effect of TDF. Michelle presented data from NAMSAL, which was a study comparing TDF3TC with dolutegravir or efavirenz 400 first line, and there was significantly more weight and BMI gain and significantly more emergent obesity in the dolutegravir recipients. In the advanced study at week 96, where the baseline BMI was higher in women than in NAMSAL, you can see numerically greater weight increases in men and women on TAF dolutegravir compared to TDF dolutegravir and the lowest weight gain on the efavirenz regimen. What you also see though is numerically more weight gain on women and if you looked at the time course, weight gain seemed to plateau after week 48 in men but continued to rise up to week 96 in women. The DEXA scan showed that men experienced similar fat and lean mass gain, whereas in women it was more fat than lean, and whether this has consequences for any clinical implications we need to see. I think most telling though is this heat graph from that study. If we look at the far left, TAF FTC dolutegravir, red is obese, yellow overweight, and green is normal. You can see from yourselves the dramatic impact of this regimen on weight in women. To finish on new drugs, Fostemzavir, in the BRIGHT study, uh, we saw 96-week results with really excellent viral suppression in highly treatment-experienced people. 
There was data on Islatrovir, or the new name for MK8591, which is a first-in-class nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor. And in a phase two study, individuals who were suppressed on Duravarine 3TC and Islatrovir triple therapy then dropped the lamivudine and continued. And it's looking promising as a two-drug regimen, Islatrovir and Duravarine. There was some data on the GS6207 capsid inhibitor. Phase one subcutaneous single dose showed a 2.2 viral load log reduction at day 14, which is really impressive. Ooh. And finally, to touch on no drugs, there's been a lot of discussion about cure, and there was one session with lots of abstracts focused on analytical treatment interruption, i.e. where people with HIV stop their antiretrovirals to see if the cure has been successful. There was much discussion about potential implication for participants and their sexual partners, and the key message was to engage the community early and continuously in trial design and conduct. And perhaps had the community been engaged much sooner after the dolutegravir NTD signal emerged, the consequence response may have been less fragmented and less confusing. Finally, to finish on access, I'm going to quote my dear friend and colleague, Professor Chloe Orkin, who in her excellent session on injectables and implants, said the future is here, but it's our collective responsibility to deliver innovation everywhere to everyone, including women and children. How can we achieve that? In the same session, we heard from Charles Gore from the Medicines Patent Pool, who successfully rolled out generic TLD to 2.7 million people by December 2018 in 26 countries, and that is now well in excess of 3 million individuals. And they're proposing to establish a long-acting technology access hub, so hopefully these very innovative treatment options can be rolled out globally sooner. So to finish by thanking some of my London colleagues and friends for all of their support, I want to thank the Track B team who put together an absolutely excellent selection of data. Of course, Brenda and Anton, our local host and IAS president, for such a, an inclusive conference. And as I said at the start, the fact that such a high proportion of presenters have been female and young is laudable. Lorraine Ruti is an absolute star from the International AIDS Society. I've now christened her Saint Lorraine. Her endless patience and kindness means I want her to run for prime minister because the one we've just earned is not very likable. I want to thank everyone here. I think the atmosphere has been absolutely amazing. I've been run ragged, but the energy at this conference has been absolutely inspiring. And my husband's never going to forgive me for this next one. I want to wish you all safe travels home. I'm looking forward to getting into my own bed with my dear husband and my cat. Thank you very much. Thank you. Laura and team, thank you for that wonderful presentation and for the, for the visuals that you gave us in our safe travels home. As we now walk to track C, it, it's great pleasure to introduce Omar Swed. He's the research director and Fundacion Usved in Buenos Aires and was recently elected president of the Argentinian Infectious Diseases Society for the period 2019 to 2021. Omar, for the next 15 minutes, the stage is yours for track C. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have a stool. I never been so well received here with this stool. You know, <laughs> I'm happy for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, in particular, to the organizers of the conference, uh, to Beatriz and Cine, that proposed me, my name for coordinating this session, and in particular to my team, Ana Garcia Ferreira from Brazil, Nicolas Naidu from South Africa, and Antonio Camiro from Mexico that uh, we work hard, hard to be in the deadline for collecting all the information. Thank you. So uh, last year, the track C was closed by Dr. Radis calling for more information and data uh, about transgender women. And this year, for first time, a plenary in the IIS was fully dedicated to transgender women, in particular to the continuum of care in PrEP. But also there were other sessions, 8080 poster and presentation about transgender women showing uh, the difficulties that these people is experienced in the every, every day in her life, and all this is aggravated by the stigma. In the Preparadas study in Brazil, 
they measure uh, the number of syndemic is 50% of the population have two or more than this condition. And this also impacted in the access to PrEP with less than 2% of people in the national PrEP program. But also there were good news, uh, ideas, solutions, like the importance of integrating gender affirmative therapies in the clinical ther in the clinical care. This is good, it's not enough. We need more structural intervention to, uh, to improve the, the life on the, on the syndemics. Also, we see the Tanger in clinic showing the, uh, the competent service delivered by transgender people improve access and reduce the stigma. The importance of the involvement of the government, uh, but still, there are many countries that doesn't recognize the gender identity. And finally, the domiciliary testing, uh, integrated testing for HIV, syphilis, many other diseases, and even the treatment at home can be, uh, can be very successful and acceptable for this population. We also heard some opinions about why some transgender researchers were not presenting, and probably uh, it was for a uh, language barrier, but anyway. Jerome Galea presented data about this uh, study, more than almost 200 people, 42% depression. Fortunately, it was mild and moderated, so it can be treated easily. We have also data from a very long uh, online survey, survey showing 13% of use of gen sex among MSM in Latin America. Uh, and among the MSM that are HIV positive, there was a big inequity uh, in age, education, and income regarding viral suppression. In the plenary, in the second plenary, uh, Cáceres showed an increasing number of HIV among youth people, uh, but this is also seen in other countries like uh, Indonesia and Malaysia. And in Africa, HPTN, OA2, and Power show that the PrEP uptake uh, is uh, highly acceptable uh, in, in, in this region. Sexual reproductive health showed that it is important to combine PrEP offer with uh, contraceptive services and family planning. Uh, and as Laura showed earlier, the ECHO trial showed higher HIV incidence, but also high acceptability to preventive intervention. The EPIC trial is a pre-wide state uh, project in Australia, uh, and in this study, uh, regarding individuals that stopped and restarted uh, during the follow-up, they can see that the, the periods when the patient, the individual stopped, were periods where the um, sexual behavior uh, decreased or the risk was decreasing. So it, this has implication for the definition of retention uh, and this continuation. But the important issue about the EPIC study is the 44% 40 per, reduction of the incidence. Uh, so in, I mean, this is a big implicance from the public health point of view. Also in the preventive study in France, uh, we see follow-up results in this big cohort, 3,000 individuals, 50% of them receiving on-demand PrEP, and this data was critical for the WHO approval of the on-demand PrEP uh, regimen. Cell testing, you obviously, increase the access, increase the, the possibility to detect uh, individuals, but also uh, the rapid distribution and high volume of the distribution is acceptable for N MSM and female sex worker in Africa and improves the 1990-90. But when the, uh, the distribution is through peers that I specifically hired for perform the, this, uh, for the convince the people to perform the HIV cell testing, they can be some, uh, some grade of coercion, so we need to be aware of that. We cannot be out of the digital change, and the HIV cell test tag reached 3.5 million 
streets. So we need to take this, use this uh, methodology to, to increase uh, demand, to increase uh, demand of the, of the participant, demand creation, sorry. <laughs> Uh, and we see in the transgender clinic, 70%, 75% of the transgender women contacted the clinic through Facebook. So we need to use this, uh, these resources. Regarding new tools uh, for the public health um, impact, we need, we have two different, two new tools, HIV-3 and the residency testing. The HIV-3 is, um, is using the Sanger sequence, we can do molecular epidemiology. And Dr. Avila showed how the, in Mexico, the, epide the epidemia, the HIV epidemic concentrate in young people, young MSM, and in particular in the center of big cities. Also in the UK, Dennis showed that the, the acute HIV in infection represent, is usually clustered and the cluster continue along the time. So this confirmed the importance that uh, the detection of the acute HIV infection has, uh, and, and we can remember the, uh, the plenary that we hear today. In the in-prep study, 0.3% of the patient starting PrEP in the same day had acute, acute HIV infection. So it is important to implement rapid tests, uh, point of care, for molecular uh, diagnosis of acute HIV infection. This molecular study can be useful also to define the situation of this very rare patient that present with ambiguous test receiving PrEP. In this very teaching conference presented by Dr. Molina, uh, you have three, three scenarios and you need to confirm the, or the presence of the absence of HIV infection, and you need to decide if continue uh, the PrEP, stop it, or initiate antiretroviral therapy, and for this you will need to call a specialist. But please try not to call a nine. The risk of resistance uh, is low in PrEP, uh, with the exception of area with a high a prevalence of 65 R mutation and sorry for, for the typo. The in-prep study is the largest same-day PrEP study, and it is in, um, being uh, developed here in Latin America, led by Brazil, including Peru and Mexico. The baseline data show high, very high prevalence of STI at the screening, and very big difference in the uh, population between Brazil, Mexico, and Peru. But also demonstrated that the intervention is safe and is feasible. Uh, and we are worried about the low retention, uh, in particular in Peru and in, other, and in a specific group like transgender women and adolescents. This new, uh, uh, very exciting uh, knew about this A5911, it's Latravir, it's never easy to, to put name, somebody need to do a name more, more easy. It's, um, uh, it's an inhibitor of the translation and has been co-formulated in an implant similar to Nexplanon and it was tested in 16 individuals, uh, healthy individuals and two different doses, and the largest dose achieve concentration, the, uh, the high concentration during at least one year. So it is a promising, a promising product for biomedical prevention in long acting. We don't know yet what is, will be the strategy if you use it alone or combine it. A post-doc analysis, post-doc analysis of Discover was presented there were no difference between arms in HIV risk, STI, or adherence. We see here higher levels of TAF in PVMC compared with tenofovir. And the analysis, the PKA analysis, showed that this level increased more quickly, but the really the clinical and biologic implications of this need to be better addressed with more research. Everybody is waiting for a vaccine since David Hu say that we will have it. So um, here we, we see the, we saw the results 
of the ASCENT trial, a phase two trial to identify which vaccine we will use in phase three trial. And actually they decided to include both of the, of the vaccines because it is better in monogenicity and a, glo a global um, coverage. And this will be the two vaccines that will be combined in the mosaic study uh, that will be uh, started soon here in Latin America uh, in several countries in Latin America. <laughs> Lastly, uh, please uh, take a look, look to those posters that all these friends send by Twitter or WhatsApp in order to be sure that we not miss anything. Uh, we have uh, the impact that the financial incentive can uh, represent in the reduction of HIV incidence in, among girls in Africa. We see that dapivirin was well accepted in the HOP study uh, and also with low HIV incidence. The HPTN 07A in which a very marginalized patient were randomized to receive a standard of, of care or case management show no difference between the arm. So we need to look for more uh, intervention to address the syndemics of these high vulnerable, vulnerable people. Uh, the conception service when including the male uh, could increase in 1990 in Africa. Landovitz presented the high use of polysubstance among MSM, but this does an impact in the PrEP adherence. It is important to, in this paper, the pain navigator could reach very easily and in cost-effective way female sex worker to testing. And two interesting preclinical studies showing the potential use of raltegravir plus 3TC for PrEP and the potential use of one single dose of TAF, FTC, Evitegravir after uh, the exposure as in an on-demand PEP. So the take home message are, we need to expand cell test, PrEP, send day, antiretroviral and TAS for making public health impact. We need to enhance participation and representation of transgender women. We need to increase the focus in your MSM and other key population we can identify in our countries and overcome stigma and syndemics. And we can use new technologies for improve HIV programming. And please stay tuned for implants and long-term PrEP options. But I also hear here that we need to do, we, we need to try to make prevention sexy. So thank you very much uh, and do it. Thank you. Thank you. Omar and team, thank you very much. That was track C. And our final track before we pass on to the closing ceremony, I'd really like to introduce Sergio Bautista Arredondo. He's the director of the Division of Health Economics and Health System Innovations at the National Institute of Public Health here in Mexico. So welcome, Sergio. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to start by acknowledging all the help I received during these past three days from a great team, um, mostly from Mexico, as you can see, very heavy Mexican team, heavily Mexican. I want to start with some background um, on this presentation. First, this is the first year that TRACD is not only about implementation science, but also about social and behavioral science. And this is welcome because implementation science is very complex and social and behavioral sciences kind of help a lot. It also makes the reporting more complex, but that's okay. Um, another important point of, of um, background, because implementation science is relevant at the end of the pipeline of delivering services, um, a, a very important aspect of what we've, er, we've been looking in the past three days in this track has to do with the progress, progress towards the 1990-90 targets. So that was very important. I also wanted to tell you, as a matter of, of background, um, what we, the team in this, in this track, were looking for in the presentations that, and, and the sessions we were, we were um, joining. First thing, we were looking uh, for evidence on and innovations in implementation strategies, scale-up strategies, um, um, a scale, a scaling up successful interventions. We heard a lot about, about PrEP in this, in, this, in this topic. We were also looking for reaching 
in implementation of, 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 of programs reaching key populations, linking them to HIV services, and keeping those already engaged. We were also looking for impact uh, 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 evaluations of programs and, and policies. On the other hand, we were also looking for challenges, barriers for acceptability, access, retention, at different levels of structural, local, and individual um, levels. Um, finally, we were uh, very interested in looking for aspects related to financing and efficiency of program implementation. So those are the topics we were looking for. What did we find? I want to give you an, an overview of the themes that we found in, in these past three days in the track D. First, one very important message that we saw and we heard over different sessions was the importance of accurate, timely data as the core of good programming design, implementation, and evolution of programs. This is very important for implementation science because programs need to evolve in the, based on the reality of the implementation. Second message or theme, involvement of the community is critical for programmatic success. We heard a lot of examples on this. This is also very, very important and we're having more and more evidence on this. But not only um, involving the community in the implementation of the programs, but we also heard a lot about involving the community all along, from the design of the programs being a key part of the design, and even we heard uh, very interesting discussions on involving the community in generating evidence and involving them in research. Another important topic, um, we, um, we witnessed uh, a few um, really nice examples of culturally mindful interventions. This is where the basic science and the efficacy trials becomes really complex, adapting to the specific context uh, in where the services are delivered. We saw examples of very culturally mindful interventions that address structural complex barriers and problems. Stigma and the link between stigma and decisions was key. We heard a lot about stigma in the sessions. Finally, and this is more and more and more at the end of social sciences, um, we saw examples of how context matters. This is very, very important. Laws matter and other aspects of the context where programs are de delivered are very important um, in alleviating or exacerbating vulnerability and risk. Those are the main themes, the main topics, and I wanted to show a few examples of each one of them. In terms of the importance of the data, we heard from Ambassador Birks um, in the context of the DREAMS program, which is a really nice program for um, young female um, and adolescent women um, in, in Africa, how they use data to identify key gaps in reaching specific populations and how this information is key in shaping the design of the programs. In the DREAMS core package, um, girls and young women are the, at the center and with the objectives of reducing risk, mobilizing communities and strengthening families, data use is used all along to inform the design of the programs. Even though there is a core package, there, there are differences across countries and across populations. Also in the context of the DREAMS program, we heard really nice examples of how um, data is used to evolve programs. Not only evaluate the, the, the impact and the success of the programs, but also how the programs can be um, uh, redesigned. For example, they look at the variation in HIV detection at the um, district level in all these countries. They found success stories and other not so successful in, in different places, and they use this heterogeneity to redefine the programs. We also heard from, the, um, um, from, from Navindra Persav about the linkages program, another very successful, complex, comprehensive um, HIV program implemented in almost 40 countries, and how they use data all along the process from understanding the population and the situation the, and the problems they are addressing to planning and implementation of the response and the monitoring and evaluation of the programs. Another interesting example that we saw, and this is, this is the only financing e evaluation that we saw in this conference, um, 
an impact evaluation on development assistance in 74 recipient countries between 2000 and 2015, um, where they found that development assistance crowded in domestic private health, private health investment, this is, this is very important, and also translated into reductions of incidence of TB prevalence of HIV and mortality. Second message, involving the community critical for programmatic success. We heard that this really nice example in Australia where HIV programs focused on easy access, peer-based health promotion, and community mobilization, leading to 92, 97, and 95 result. This is linked to involving the communities in program implementation. Another really nice example from the US among black and Latin MSM, they leverage the existing social networks and they increase knowledge, communication skills about PrEP use and reduce PrEP stigma. Um, they also found interesting results and promising results in terms of feasibility with really high retention at, uh, at 12 weeks and also in terms of acceptability of this approach. Community involvement all along, not only in the implementation, but also in other, in other phases of the process. Um, we heard from Miriam Hartman how community engagement is, be, is being taken more seriously in clinical trials, and we saw um, interesting examples. We have good, good participatory practices, and, and pharmaceutical companies are starting using them. That's encouraging. We also heard from the iPrevent study in Cape Town where they engage end users in the research process before the products reach the market. And also from the AMP studies experience where early and ongoing community engagement in HIV prevention and efficacy trials is proving successful, feasible, and it's being um, uh, increased. Culturally mindful interventions. This is really important for implementation. And also is very, very complex. Uh, we saw a few examples of how this can be done. Um, really nice example in Mozambique, the Sawa Sawa intervention, when they used mass media um, combined with um, community dialogue, positive prevention groups, groups aiming at reducing stigma. I can say this in 10 seconds, that this, this was a lot of work a lot of being present in the community, listening, and sometimes changing the minds of the researchers and implementing a successful program. They found a reduction at the community level of stigma among all participants, and this was linked to increasing HIV testing among men. I think this is a really nice example of how um, a relatively simple intervention, testing, um, which is sometimes a great challenge it takes a lot of work in the implementation phase to be successful. Another example of multi-level interventions, uh, the effect of consistent access to school feeding among other components um, linked to the delay of risk sexual behaviors in South Africa, particularly among men, and it was consistent access to these services that made the difference. Laws and context, uh, this, is, this is very important and we're growing in complexity of how, it, how can we address these issues. But we saw a, a, an example of how important this is. Um, Carrie Lyons show using individual level data uh, to characterize the relationship between HIV infection and the legal context of sex work across 10 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And she showed how um, um, female sex workers face um, significantly greater odds of HIV linked to different types of stigma, and this was exacerbated by criminalized context. Another example of how context is important uh, in this study in the US, where they found that alcohol and drug consumption, while alcohol and drug consumption is higher among white men, um, HIV prevalence is a lot higher among African Americans. So there, there are no link between those two behaviors. There is a link, however, between HIV and the network, the density and the homophily. So very close sexual and um, social networks are linked to um, higher risk for HIV. Stigma was very important, as I mentioned before, and has a great impact in 
to access um, uh, along the cascade of HIV services. In this study in Kenya, they identified types of stigma. This is a really interesting approach linked or coming from different sources and expressed in different ways. And just to give you an example, the product stigma is very important for access and retention to PrEP, where users have to keep the secret, the pills for PrEP, because the bottle is very similar to ARVs. And someone who doesn't know about PrEP could think they have HIV. And that's how, um, I, I think, a, a very relevant example of thinking better how we implement uh, technologies and programs is very important in understanding this. More about stigma and retention. In Australia, 25% discontinuation in PrEP linked to being trans on gen or gender diverse, injecting drug use or methamphetamine use. These are important factors linked to both stigma and less access to services. The same in, in, in Brazil, 13% PrEP discontinuation linked to being sex work worker of or homeless. Not everything was bad news. We also heard this morning that from Carrie Leons using implementation, uh, uh, literature ser search, uh, using implementation research to assess stigma. This is very complex to assess, but they found, even though most of the examples were pilot or once-off implementations, implemented at the very different levels, they found promising results, and their recommendations are that implementation science could support the dissemination of stigma reduction interventions. I want to end by emphasizing the themes we heard today, uh, in the past three days, um, in, in, the, in the implementation science track. Accurate and timely data is the core of, core of good programming. Involvement of, invo involvement of the community is critical for programmatic success. Culturally mi mindful interventions, although are very difficult to implement, uh, are very important to address complex problems. Stigma is very important, and it's related to decisions. And this is something we have to consider. And the context is also very important and is linked to increased or reduction in vulnerability and risk. We also heard that social and behavioral science is underfunded. And I hope um, you agree with me that we saw in these three days really great examples that this should change and we should increase funding for this type of research. Thank you.